Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soil podcast. I am your host, Kate Kavanaugh, and it is always such a pleasure to be with you here each and every week. I have a really exciting guest today. His name is Dr. Bill Schindler, and when I found his work, I couldn't stop consuming it. I read his incredible book, Eat Like a Human. I listened to him on probably at least half a dozen podcasts and just really did a deep dive. Something that you might not know about me is that I actually went to college for a double major in biology and physical anthropology and was very interested in the forces that shaped modern homo sapien. And then I found myself as a butcher and then as a nutrition therapist and now the host of this lovely podcast and owner of a butcher shop and a small kitchen in Denver, Colorado. And I think because of this, I really connected deeply to Bill's work. Bill is not just an experimental anthropologist, he is also a restaurant owner himself. He is a butcher, he is a hunter, he is just an incredible renaissance man of exploring how our connection to food makes us human and all the myriad of ways that that is made manifest. And his lens on this really changed my perspective on how humans eat. And this is something that I've looked at a lot over the years, but Bill's work is incredibly comprehensive and the way that he breaks down the different food groups and the technologies that humans employed to process their food and to get nutrients and to look at how that influenced our biology is incredible. Um, It's honestly just the most exciting thing that I have read in some time, and I know that you are just going to deeply connect to Bill's work. Um, I actually get the pleasure of meeting Bill later this week, and so it is just with the most excitement that I introduce this episode. I'm going to keep this intro pretty short, but one thing that I want to mention is that, and we've talked about this a little bit before on intros, is that I often really dive deep into an individual's work and I sometimes jump in a little bit ahead. And so I really encourage you to seek out some podcasts where Uh, Bill lays the foundation for his work, and I'll link to some of those in the show notes, and to dive into his book, because him and I get into some some little niche topics inside of this episode as, as we explore what it means to eat like a human. And so I just encourage all of you to seek out his work. I've linked to a couple of things in the show notes. And really, I just want us to dive in. As always, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you could leave a rating and review, it really helps mind, body, and soil, and this work reach the ears of people far and wide. So I'm so appreciative when you do that. It's such a pleasure to be with here with you each and every week. And... I can't wait to hear what you think of the podcast. So drop me a DM or shoot me an email and let me know what you thought. Without further ado, here is Dr. Bill Schindler. Dr. Bill, I was just telling you, it was it's such a pleasure to have you on today. I, diving into your work has been just the greatest gift over the last month, and I can't stop listening to podcasts that you've been on and just kind of absorbing all this information, and your book is incredible, so it's just such a pleasure to have you here. Well, well I am super excited for the conversation. Thank you for having me. Good. Um, I want to dive in. I don't really want to dilly dally. And so I want to dive in a little bit with your origin story first and how you came to this, which I think is important before we get into some of our own human origins and, and how we got to where we are as organisms. Well, to start, and, and I'll do a brief version because I know we talked earlier, uh, some of this stuff I've gone over in a bunch of other podcasts that people can listen to, but I do think it's important to, to start there to know where we're coming from. And you know, I've been a professor for over 20 years. Uh, I'm not one now, but I was. And one of the first things that I started every single class with is certainly introductions for all the students, but also introducing myself to the students because 
every bit of information we get from another human is biased. I, I know, it, it always is, no matter how hard we, we try not to have it biased. And the best way to overcome that bias, or at least deal with it, is to face it, is to understand where people are coming from. So I, you know, People call me Dr. Bill Schindler and I have a PhD. I am not a medical doctor. My PhD is in archaeology and anthropology. And I think it gives me a unique perspective that I can't wait to dive into with you throughout the next uh, time that we're having this conversation. But it started, my origin story started as a, as a kid, an overweight kid with a poor self body image. Um, you know, I was a product of the 70s and the 80s and all the things that everyone told us we should be doing and not doing and eating lean chicken breast and spinach and staying away from butter and eating margarine, all those, all those sorts of things. My parents are incredible parents and worked very hard to keep me as healthy as they could, but they were working under those guidelines, you know, doing what they, what they thought they should be doing. So uh, incredibly overweight kid, um, poor self body image. Food was something that I was, that just, I, I looked at it and knew I had to eat it. I loved eating it because I had that, you know, that, I was addicted to carbs. But I, uh, it, it wasn't something that I viewed as, as nourishment. Uh, this entire time, you know, my mother had me in the kitchen. My father had me in the woods, hunting, trapping, fishing, camping, hiking, all those wonderful things, um, which was very connective. You know, I was very connected to him through those processes, very connected to my environment through those processes. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the link was never made between those activities and actually true nourishment. And we can get to that part later. Uh, eventually, I became, uh, despite my weight, I became an athlete in high school and was working. I was so dedicated to it, and working out so incredibly hard that the weight fell off and I looked the part of an athlete and actually played the part of an athlete. Um, <laughs> eventually, uh, wrestled for Ohio State and the College of New Jersey, two incredible uh, programs, one of Division Three and one of Division One program, um, and did well, but I never felt right. I always had issues with, um, with my gut. I always had skin issues. I always was battling my weight, but it was a different kind of battle, you know, for, for wrestling. And food went from something that I knew was making me look a certain way to, to something I was scared of when I was wrestling because I had to make weight. And then finally, the big, you know, the biggest change happened when I was no longer a college athlete and all the weight poured back on in my 20s and my 30s. And I was suffering from all sorts of, uh, you know, all the issues that, you know, many people that are, you know, I was, I, I know for sure, even though I wasn't tested, I, I'm confident I was pre-diabetic. I had restless leg syndrome. My guts was screw, screwed up. I was sick all the time. And I just you know, just wasn't living my best life. And this entire time I was trying to figure out what I should be eating. And I realized it was finally about 20 years ago, um, right after I got married, that I started to put pieces together and use all the work that, you know, the time my mother had me in the kitchen, the time my father had me outside, and just as importantly, all my work as an anthropologist and archaeologist, putting all of those things together and looking at the world, my place in it, and diet in a completely different way that I started to heal myself. So to sort of put a button on this piece, um, major transformations for me. I just turned 50 a few days ago. I'm, I'm, I'm literally experiencing the best health of my life right now at 50, which is includes the time I spent as a Division One athlete at one of the best wrestling programs in the country. I'm healthier now than I was then, in better shape Amazing. now than I was then. And um, use that... Uh, everything that I learned and I'm continuing to learn to help nourish my family. And more recently, um, we're, my wife and my family and I are so passionate about what we're doing that I left uh, the college, uh, Washington College where I was teaching. We have a nonprofit called the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is where all of our research and education is funneled through. And we actually have a restaurant called the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, which is where all of this is put into practice and we make nourishing food for the community. I'm so excited to dive into that since we've just opened up a restaurant too and to kind of talk about some of that. But before we get there, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how Modern Homo Sapien came to be and how that environment that we were interacting with and the technology that we yeah. used really shaped our biology and what is a really fragile biology, which I would love for you to touch on. And I have, uh, I have a burning question after this, uh, once you give us kind of a, a little hint of this that I want to ask. All right. So. so I was listening earlier to your podcast with Brian Sanders, which was fantastic, by the way. And I was thinking you were going to ask me something along these lines. Um, so I have to, I brought a prop, two props with me. Oh, so the I first love one, props. This is so good. <laughs> the first one is this. This is, um, so, um, 
we're going to start this story and, and I'll do a quick version of it. We can dive in deep at, a, at any time, but the quick version starts at about three and a half million years ago. <laughs> That's the quick version. And uh, it starts with this one of our, this ancestor virus. This is Australopithecus afarensis or Lu this is actually Lucy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a couple things that are interesting to, to look at at this skull. Number one, I'm not very tall. I'm sitting down anyhow, but next to me, a full grown adult would stand about this tall. So their bodies were a lot smaller, which means their nutritional needs were a lot less than ours or just because of their the reduction in body size compared to us. Secondly, and even more importantly, this is the size of their brain. Um, much, much, much smaller than ours. Our current brain represents about 2% of our body, but requires about 20% of the nutrition that we take in to fuel, which means it is the most expensive Incredible. organ in the body. Um, so to grow from a, a you know, grown body size from this to what we have now, and more importantly, to grow in brain size from this to what we have now, all requiring massive nutritional input, right, in the right way, um, is, you know, in incredible to even fathom. The story starts here with them because at this time uh, they were getting all of their food with what they had anatomically, their fingers, their fingernails, their eyes, their teeth, their muscles, or lack of all of those things really uh, impacted what they could get from their environment. And just as importantly, once they got whatever that food was, they relied solely on their digestive tract to make it safe and make it nourishing. They used no technologies whatsoever. They picked it, put it in their mouth, ate it, and then it went through their process. So much like any other wild animal today, this is, this is how our ancestors were eating. They were eating a bunch of insects, a little bit of fruit, and a little bit of vegetables. And when we, and when we try to figure, you know, when, we're going to talk a lot, I think, about some of these ancestral diets. For those of you who are listening, the picture that I'd like you to have in your mind, at least for this conversation, don't, don't, think about our ancestors or even modern day homo sapiens hunter gatherers foraging and picture the produce section of the grocery store. It, it looks nothing like that. The fruits are completely different. The vegetables are completely different. It's not the same thing whatsoever. Just like I wouldn't want you to look at the, the, the meat section in the grocery store and think about what early hunting or early butchering was like. So they were limited, incredibly limited. It wasn't like they were living in the Garden of Eden and they had all this food all the you know all year round they could get. They were eating hyper seasonally and hyper locally. They had no way to store vegetables or store fruits. They had no way to carry them long distances. There were no bags or nothing like that whatsoever. So what was growing at the right time is all they had access to. And even that was severely, you know, within that uh, group of food, what they really had access to was even more limited because you know, there was no way to detoxify these plants. So they could only eat the plants that were incredibly low in toxins and also provided nutrition without a whole lot of work for their bodies. And again, they stayed small. This worked for them. That was great. Low population size, low brain size, low body size. This is the major change. So if you can picture for a moment our, our ancestors you know, walking around three and a half feet tall with small brains, eating a little bit of berries, wild fruits, a little bit of, little, little bit of leaves, a little bit of these insects, um, doing okay, right? They're doing okay. Nothing's growing, but they're doing okay. And every now and then they're looking out, of, you know, over a cliff onto the savanna and they see a predator take down another animal. And the scene that unfolds in front of them happens over and over again, right? So you have a predator, and it's the same thing that happens today on the savanna. A predator takes down an animal and kills it and rips it apart and dives in and eats the blood, the fat, and the organs. And they gorge themselves on this. It isn't like they take down a big water buffalo and like eat the shoulder. It doesn't happen <laughs> that way. They dive in, no. <laughs> rip it apart and eat the blood, the fat and the organs and they go off and sleep and they leave this massive, you know, they're gorged, they're, they're digesting their meal. I, I like to say it's kind of after Thanksgiving when we gorge ourselves and sleep on the couch afterwards when the football game's on. That's what, what's happening. And they leave this carcass covered in flesh. And at that, you know, when that happens today, modern day hyenas and buzzards perfectly biologically equipped to make a meal out of that, that flesh that's left, die, go in there and eat it. In the past, it was the ancestors to modern day hyenas and buzzards that go in and do this. This is happening over and over again. And meanwhile, our ancestors are looking at all this meat on the savanna. They look down at their nails. They realize they have nothing that equips them to grow, you know, rip meat off that carcass. And they're just watching it happen until, and this is the, this is the, uh, the prop that I have. This is a, a resin cast, exact replica of the oldest stone tool ever found. It was found just west of Lake Turkana in Kenya, and it dates to 3.3 million years, old, years ago. 
And it's hard to see here, but it was struck right there. So one of the, we think it was also the Pithecus afarensis struck this rock right here and knocked this off. And it doesn't look like much. But first of all, remember, this thing is 3.3 million years old. So it's pretty good looking for that age. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was razor sharp. And it took less than a second to make. It took millions of years for somebody to figure out how to do this, but it took less than a second to make once they had two rocks in their hands. And what happened in that moment transformed our relationship with our environment forever. I mean, if you want to know the key to the human diet or the diet that built us as, as, as humans, this is that key, the creation of this tool and then all the other technologies that came after. And with this tool, it has an edge that's sharper and more durable than anything on our bodies or their bodies. They could use this tool and butcher and you know jump in and they became scavengers and introduced meat into their diet at around 3.3, 3.4 million years ago. We know this not only because we found the tools, but we've also found the bones of animals that were butchered and show the butchering marks and also the bones were cracked open to get at the nutrient dense marrow on the inside. So that's the origin of, of really what I consider to be the human diet. And the, the big takeaway here is that because of technological inputs like stone tools, fire, hunting technology, fermentation, nishtamalization, and a whole host of other things, we have the ability to overcome our own physical limitations, access resources in the environment that we're not biologically designed to access, and most importantly, transform those resources into their safest and most nourishing bioavailable forms for our bodies. And because we did this and got increasingly better at it as time goes on, we we're able to support massive body and brain growth. We modern day homo sapiens are here in these bodies with these brains because of technologies just like this. I want to touch on something and I hope it doesn't feel really silly, but as <laughs> I've listened to you talk about this over and over again, and I think it's so fascinating. And I want to talk a little bit more about that brain and body growth as these technologies change, but you talk about how fragile we are, that we have mm. these nails and we just don't have the, the tools, right? We're creating the tools to make them. And every time you talk about this, I have this burning question for you about biological luck playing a little bit of a role in this, that while physiologically we might be sort of weak and needing these other tools, we have something that other animals don't, mm -hmm. and it's a thumb. Absolutely. And I want to talk about how the creation of these tools is dependent in a lot of ways on having an opposable thumb and having the fine motor skills that allow us to create this old stone tool to eventually harness fire and to do some of the finer things to ferment and break these things down because I wonder at the same time if cetaceans, something like a dolphin, had a thumb, what physiological, mm -hmm. you know, weaknesses could they have overcome? All right. So I'm glad, so glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is this, 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 this luck. And, and, and that is, is a really good word. First off, um, there's a couple of sort of evolutionary things I want to just uh, create a foundation with so everybody listening to this so we all be, can all be on the same page. First off, um, survival of the fittest, and Darwin never said this, and when I used to teach evolution at, at college, it's one of the first things you would talk about, I'd say that is not the image we should have in our head, right? It's more like the joke about when you're with your friends and you know a bear comes and, attack and chases you, you don't have to be the fastest, you just can't be the slowest one running away because that's the one that gets eaten by the bear. That's exactly the way evolution works. So there's there's a whole lot of adaptations that are happening on a regular basis for all life on earth. Um, and the ones that creates, and, and a lot of times it's, it's complete luck. It's a genetic mutation that happens for a variety of different reasons. Um, it could be, you know, lo lo there's a lot of different mechanisms. Genetic mutation is one. And all of a sudden a new trait arises. It doesn't have to be adaptive to stick around. It just needs to make sure that that new trait doesn't negatively impact the ability for that organism to live and, and, and procreate and for that organism and, and, the, and the offspring to be able to live and procreate. Let's say if, if, let's say if, if whatever happened 
killed you when you're you know 10 years old and it would kill before they you know humans become have the ability to reproduce then that trait would go away through natural selection right so but if, if a trait arises and it doesn't negatively impact it natural selection won't work on it because it's not there, there, there's actually no mechanism for it to happen so the arisal something like the appearance of an opposable thumb um yet absolutely is probably due to some complete chance or, or a combination of chances that happened over time um, and was there for some time before it even served some sort of some sort of an advantage. The other thing that's very interesting for us to consider is that for most life on Earth, the natural selection is operating in a completely natural system. Right. So like I mentioned, if, if it's a, the, the um, appearance of this trait and uh, negatively impacts the ability to reproduce viable offspring, then it, then natural selection will work out. If not, it'll just kind of stick around. Um, in humans, it's completely different. Humans are operating within both a natural and cultural system at the same time. Mm. And this is where it gets really, really complicated because, um, you know, there, there are a lot of cultural things that are happening within the, the human world that impact whether we can reproduce viable offspring. And some of it's, you know, what, 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 what do we consider um, to be attractive anymore? You know, what, what, what's somebody's socioeconomic status? What is their ability to have access to healthcare? All of these things impact our ability to successfully reproduce viable offspring. So there's a lot of different things happening with humans that have been happening. And, and I am confident that um, our ancestors very far back had some level of culture and communication where they're operating within one of these cultural systems that we have to pay, pay, pay attention to. But with all that said, directly answer your question, opposable thumbs convinced it's completely random that they appeared. Um, and their use though is, is a little bit more interesting to think about. I um, was doing a TV thing in, in Ireland a few years ago for, for an episode on, um, it was an episode about uh, veganism, believe it or not. And at one point, I remember we were kind of walking through the woods and there were these cameras on us and we were talking and I was talking to the host of the show and the show's called What Are You Eating? And he asked me a question that I thought was very, very interesting that I never thought about before and I haven't stopped thinking about since. He said, okay, I get this, you know, the, you know, the food and, you know, kind of what we laid out earlier and better access to food and this nutrition and, okay, all this incredible nutrition is flooding into our ancestors' diets. But, you know, what happens if you feed a chimpanzee, a whole bunch more food. Like, are their brains going to grow? And, and I looked at him and I said, no, if you gave a whole bunch more food to a chimpanzee, you just have a fat chimpanzee. Like, it, like it, it was, it was a really, really good question. The, the reality is, and we have to think about the thumb piece with this at the same time too, is there, and the way I frame it now is the, the, the increase in incredible nutrition that came into our ancestors' diets because of these technological innovations didn't push our brains to get bigger, didn't push our bodies to get bigger. There was something, some other mechanisms that were pushing for those things to get bigger. Um, but the ability to have that incredible nutrition in our diets supported that body and brain growth. And you can say the same thing about the thumbs because those thumbs are incredibly necessary to create a stone tool like this, <laughs> to start a fire, to paint on cave walls, to communicate with one another. All th those thumbs are incredibly important to it. So as you have this, some, some sort of mechanism, and, I, and there's a couple thoughts about what those could be, mechanisms that's pushing our brains and our bodies to get bigger. And then you have these thumbs that are creating technologies that allow some members, you know, some of our ancestors to outcompete others. They're more what we call fit and fitness in an evolutionary sense is our ability to reproduce viable offspring. It doesn't have to do with muscles necessarily. And, and, and those who are doing that have more successful offspring. And, you know, and that certainly, certainly just, just continues. So to, again, the short answer to your question is I'm convinced it was pure luck that, that they were there, but the fact that they were there, um, was one of the things that allowed us to start to reach our potential. That was, you know, the, these other things were driving what that potential was going to be. Yeah. Thank you for that. Because every time you talk about not having many physical advantages, I always go back to this idea of the thumb perhaps being the ultimate physical advantage. The thumb and the way we were thinking for yes. the, those, the combination of those two is powerful. powerful. Yes. 
What are some of those other mechanisms, you know, just briefly that might be driving that? Because one of the points I wanted to hit is when we get to be hunters and we get to access what you talked about, those predators accessing initially, the Mm -hmm. fat, the organs, all of these really nutrient rich things. But it sounds like there are some other mechanisms at play that are beginning to shape the trajectory of our evolution. Sure. And and there's, there's a couple of things. So one is culture and the, this, this gets a little bit complicated here, but um, one of the questions that uh, I get asked quite often, you speak when I was a professor more, but now sometimes when I'm speaking, um, I talk, you know, eventually in this conversation is going to get there with the, uh, the conversation gets to the domestication of plants, domestication of animals. And, um, you know, somebody always ends up asking, you know, what was the first domesticated plant? What was the first domesticated animal? Um, first domesticated plant, there's a, there's a lot of potentials for that right now. Um, Some people actually say it's maize. Some people actually are saying it's potatoes. Um, Some, you know, it was funny because when I was in eighth grade, we learned about the Fertile Crescent and the first plant domestication all happened in the Fertile Crescent. Now there's a lot of other places in the world that are vying for that early piece, but it's somewhere around 12, 14,000 years ago, right? Um, The the first domesticated animal is a lot more difficult. You know, a lot of people put that at the dog, uh, which was a kind of a co-domestication, really cool event that happened probably on the Mongolian steppe about 35,000 years ago or so, way, way, way early. And then we don't see a lot of animal domestication until about 10,000 years ago. But my answer is the first domesticated animal was humans. And the definition of domestication for me is you take a wild animal put it in a cultural environment, an environment where humans are taking care of it, right? We were able to, um, you know, make protect it or keep things warm or protect it from predators or feed it in a different way. And, and, and those, um, and this happens long enough that the animal that is being taken, animal or plant that's being taken care of genetically changes because of the cultural inputs that are, that, that are helping it survive and, and actually allowing it to change and becomes dependent on these cultural inputs. If that's true, then this is the beginning of domestication because since we were creating, our ancestors were creating technologies and because of these technologies, we were able to introduce new and different foods in an incredibly nutrient dense bioavailable way. Our bodies biologically changed in response to this. And because our bodies were changing in response to this and require at some point requiring this, this massive nutritional input, we now are, are living in bodies that we can't survive without these technological inputs. We don't have the, the, the digestive tract or even the nails or the muscles or anything to, to get that food and put it in the right state that we can support these bodies w- without technology. So we began domesticating ourselves, putting ourselves in a cultural environment at least three and a half million years ago. Now, with that cultural environment, with those changes, comes a lot of things we have to navigate. And one of those things we have to navigate are social relationships. Um, And so one of the, this is a long-winded way of saying, one of the things that some people suggest are driving our brains to get bigger is having to navigate social relationships, increasingly complex social relationships. It isn't just, you know, your family unit anymore. These groups are growing and these groups are, you know, we have language, we have, you know, now we have to manage more than 12 people. It's 30 people, 50 people, a hundred people. And there's a lot of numbers in anthropology. There's a number that says, you know, humans can own, even today with social media can only manage a certain number of meaningful relationships in their life. And it's one of the most taxing things that we do as humans is to manage these social relationships. We need them. We require them for, for a so, lot, so much emotional and cultural health, but they are exhausting and require a lot of brain power. So one suggestion is as we build culture and as we build population size and as we have to you know, navigate these social relationships, our brains are getting pushed and pushed and pushed to grow. There's some suggestions that it's hallucinogenic drugs <laughs> that are yes. making us think outside of the box. And, yeah. and there's, there, there, there's a couple of really good books on this, on this topic. Um, and, and, you know, just taking, you know, the, you know, the hallucinogenic drugs, pushing our brains to think outside of the box. Mm-hmm. And with that push and the influx of incredible nutrition and then the push and things are starting to grow. And um, the, the reality is, uh, and there's probably a, a thousand things more. One problem I have with a lot of these anthropological um, hypotheses is that it always ends up with, okay, which one is it? And the reality is there's probably 10 or 15 things happening it's all a at the same time. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's a constellation. And I think anybody who understands how an ecosystem or how systems biology works, it's never any one thing. We can't reduce right. it down in that way as much as this sort of Cartesian model of science wants to find this, this single point of, of reduction. It's, it's not possible. And I think that what's really beautiful about your work is kind of exploring it exploring all the different confluences of what might be influencing our, our bodies and our brains to change and shift. Absolutely. And let me just say one other thing. Yeah. Um, and and the, the, the other part of it is that as these things are, you know, as we're putting ourselves in a cultural environment, as we're maybe thinking hallucinogenic drugs, as we're thinking outside of the box, as we're uh, uh, out of the box and we're dreaming in different ways, the technologies that we're creating require more and more and more uh, thought and, and, and more thinking out of the box. So for example, it may not look like much, but this stone tool, the creation of this stone tool requires us to think in a completely different way than we ever thought about before. Like in order to do this and then do it again, we have to, we have to plan into the future. And even though we have to get the right kind of rock that fractures in the right way, this isn't, um, you know, I, I have a good friend who was the um, uh, technical consultant. Unfortunately, he passed recent, uh, a few years ago, Steve Watts. But he was a technical consultant on um, the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks. And he made all the stuff, um, including Wilson, the volleyball, for, for the movie. But um, one of the things they had to do was make sure that the right kind of rock was on the island when Tom Hanks was out there so he could make the right stone tool. And they actually imported rock, something called the Rye Lake from North Carolina, onto the island to make sure it was actually there for him. You know, making stone tools is not just banging two rocks together. It might have been the very first time, mm -hmm. but it requires, uh, you know, chess-like thinking, planning three, four, five moves in advance um, in order to, to, to successfully create the kind of tools that we need to create. And this is massive thought. I mean, this is the kind of thinking that we're, we're teaching in schools, and they're doing it millions of years ago with rocks in their hands. So as the technologies become increasingly advanced, the brain power you know, required to make those to, to see those to fruition is increasing as well. And I think it's just feeding off of itself. And then obviously mm -hmm. feeding part is, you know, we're getting the right kind of nutrition to support all of it. That's fascinating. Like that really, that really captivates me in how, in how having to think and having to problem solve becomes a part of the way that we're evolving our thinking and problem solving that it, right. it is that. And um, I'd love to touch briefly. I, th I think you kind of included it. I'd love to just briefly touch on, we become hunters. We get access to those super nutrient dense parts of the animal, because this is something that we're going to come back to later on in the conversation. And that, that also kind of represents a shift. And I think it's happening at 2 million years ago, right? We're jumping about one yep. and a half million years into the future to where we're actually hunting, not just scavenging the meat, but we're getting more of the animal. Right. So the crazy thing is that at about three and a half million years ago, we introduced meat into the diet. And for, you know, again, it's scavenged meat. We, we don't have any idea how much of a significant impact the introduction of meat then had on the diet. Is it, is it daily? Is it once a month? Is it like three really cool times a year? Like we don't know what it is. We know it's happening because we have that evidence, but it's really hard to reconstruct, you know, what that meant on a daily basis. What we do know is that it happens at this time and it persists in a very similar way for about a million and a half years. And throughout that million and a half years, we have speciation, we have things happening, you know, we have the uh, creation of the first member of our genus, Homo habilis, um, and the brain isn't changing much. Brain and body size isn't really changing with the introduction of meat into the diet. And again, the quick caveat there is, it, I'm not suggesting that they're eating three ribeyes worth of steak a day, and we don't see a huge change. For what, whatever's happening, we introduced meat to the diet about three and a half million years ago, and for the next million and a half years, there isn't a huge bit of uh, transformation in body or brain size. The biggest transformation we see happens at about two million years ago, and there's the introduction of two technologies around that same time, which I'm convinced is, is uh, providing nutrition to allow those um, those changes to occur in the, on that massive scale. One is the introduction of fire and control of fire. Um, it is a very, there's several people along with me that believe control of fire started at 2 million years ago. 
Um, there's a lot of people that won't put that data at that early. I'm convinced it happens at least then. Um, but if it does happen, then it, you know, a lot of wonderful things come along with the introduction of fire, the ability to cook our food, which in some cases is good, some is bad, um, the ability to make foods uh, a little bit more safe in some instances, the ability mm. to do things to food to allow us mm. to store it, to allow us to change a bunch of different things in our environment, like light and heat and modify materials like glues to do things. So there's a lot of wonderful things that happen with fire. But for me, the most transformational thing that happens in our diets at 2 million years ago is we, for the first time ever, can take animals down at will. We become hunters. And with that, we become the apex predator. We become those lions on the, on the savanna who have first access to the animals that we take down. We have the ability to say, hey, I'm going to eat the blood, the fat, and the organs, and maybe I'll eat the meat, maybe I'll leave it behind, but it, it, it's whatever we want we have access to. And that blood, fat, and organs are the most nutrient-dense bio, bioavailable parts of an animal, and it's then that we see the biggest jump in body and brain size. I think that this is just incredible, and I kind of want to dive into the history of butchery. And, you know, one of the things we talked about before this interview is I'm going to skip a lot of the things that you've talked about in other interviews because you've been so generous with your time. And so I think that there's a lot of pieces to dive into and eat like a human is also a beautiful place for people to start. Um, but Thank I have you. some kind of some kind of off the beaten path and, and there, I, I wish that they were a little bit more cohesive, but we might, we might jump around a little right. bit as we kind of get into this. And that first thing I want to kind of play off of this moment when we go from maybe eating meat to eating animal and this distinction that you make that I think is vitally important. And I think I'm, I'm probably just satisfying my own need as a butcher to talk about this because something that, my husband and I have been talking about in the last decade of owning a butcher shop is the way in which we consume meat as modern humans. And mm -hmm. we're leaving a lot on the table in a, in both a literal and a figurative way. And, you know, from a live weight animal to cuts as it is done in, in the industry, we have about a 40% yield. So yeah. about 60% of the animal gets thrown out, thrown away or moves on to other industries. And I think that with this food that we really, really changed a lot of our trajectory as humans, we're eating a lot of organ meats and we're we're having a different methionine to glycine ratio that we have now as we eat more connective tissue and mm. different things. And so I just want to touch on this difference between eating meat and eating animal. Yeah. So let me just say that, that's brilliant. Let me just say uh, what happened in my life that made me start really thinking about this. So about, oh, I don't even know, it was probably about Seven, 15, 16, 17 years ago, I was asked to do a, a review of um, uh, a four-part archaeological book series. And it was, uh, it was about a, a series of sites at a place called St. Catherine's Island off the coast of Georgia. And the person that wrote the book was David Hurst Thomas, who's a famous archaeologist. He, I don't know if he still is, but he was the head of archaeology at the Museum of Natural History in New York. And here I am kind of a, a new professor and I got asked to do a re review of, uh, by a good friend of mine, uh, of, of this four part series, which was essentially his life's work. And so I wanted to make sure I did a really good job of it. And I was very, very thorough. I spent months reading through it all and looking things up. And it, it, it's, a, it's a brilliant work. Um, but the one thing I had trouble with was his reconstruction of the uh, ancient diets from the sites that he found, from the archaeology that he found. And he keeps underrepresenting um, the white-tailed deer. And he keeps saying that the white-tailed deer here, you know, is they're only they're only eating about 50% of the deer. They're only eating about 50% of the deer. And like, where's he coming up with this number, 50% of the deer? Like, I, I, I've read a bunch of ethnographies at this time about people over the world and, you know, the Sami and the Inuits and you know, eating the whole entire, where's he come up with this 50% thing? And I finally started diving back into his references. And it turns out that his entire um, hypothesis about how these Native Americans prehistorically were using this deer comes from a 1950s animal husbandry book where they are talking about 
how when you take apart a pig properly, you use 55% of the animal. You take apart a cow properly, beef cow, it's 50% of the animal. And he, and he did all of this prehistoric dietary reconstruction based on this 1950-something animal husbandry book. So this prompted me to try to figure out what he was missing from this. And, and the interesting thing is at the end of it, when he kind of looks over all his own work, he even says, I don't understand it. You know, the deer, the white tailed deer is way overrepresented from what it should be based upon my calculations. And I'm like, yeah, well, I, I understand why. So me and a biologist at the college and, and a, a senior, one of our senior students um, did this research. And I think it's really important in this conversation. And you might've heard me talk about it before, but it's, it's, it's worth it. Give me two seconds. We took, uh, was it four, I think 14 white tailed deer and we, uh, males and females, different ages, and we weighed them. And then we butchered them the way that he had suggested these native Americans are butchering, which by the way, is the same way that most hunters in this country would take them up, take them, uh, you know, take the, take them apart. And we put all that meat that is typically kept and put it aside. We didn't even account for it. I mean, we ate it, but we put it aside. It wasn't part of the calculations. What we were interested in was everything that's left behind. So from, you know, a typical way that most hunters go apart, taking apart a white-tailed deer, put aside what they keep and what's left behind in the field or in the butcher shop or whatever was what we were looking at. And we spent weeks taking every piece of this animal. We accounted for the testicles and the eyes and the brains and all the guts and we took the marrow out of every single you know talk about painstaking every oh, yeah. bit of every bone that was out of everything even the, the phalanges everything and we did and and this isn't perfect because we just accounted for calories but calories was the easy way to at least do some calculations and accounted for the calories that were left behind after we took the meat off and depending on if you were a couch potato or an olympic athlete your, your caloric needs the part that's left behind from an average size white tailed deer on the eastern shore of Maryland would provide 13 to 31 days worth of calories. The part that's typically left behind 13 to 31 days wow. worth of calories, depending on your caloric requirements, which is massively more than the calories that are um, provided by the meat that is typically taken. And we didn't even count for vitamins and all the other wonderful things that, that come from the organ meats. No. So it's even skewed. It's not even, you know, it's not even completely representative. Yeah, it's hard to include of... nutrient density in that calculation. I, I... And, and even bioavailability, all yeah, of it isn't totally. even accounted yes. for. So <laughs> you know, I think about that all the time. I'm like, what is missing? And it's what's missing from our diets today. It, it is unbelievable. And then you start, and this is where I think both of us are so incredibly uh, passionate about. It's not just the nutrition it's the, the ethical considerations that go along with using yes. the entire animal and sustainability. You know, I, I had a, I was sitting at not long after this uh, study and, and we did, all, uh, by the way, we went to get that study published and nobody would publish it. None of the peer review journals would publish it because they didn't believe it. So, and, and this is, so it's, wow. we still are sitting on it all. We have a draft of it all written. And uh, so we have to, you know, this is years later, people's minds have changed. This is, you know, that was years ago. At least people are thinking along these lines. We should try to publish it again. Um, but the, I had a conversation with another colleague at, at lunch uh, a few days after we finished all the calculations. And this person was a vegetarian and they were really upset about the modern, you know, meat industry. And they were trying to take me to task to say, hey, oh my, you know, all the, how much input do we have to cows and this and that, you know, all the, all the regular vegetarian arguments about why we shouldn't be eating meat. And I said, listen, man, I hear you. And there's a lot of things that need to change in the modern meat industry. But I'll tell you right now, all the calculations that you're telling me can change, even if they're accurate, which they, I don't think they were, but even if they were, I could change those calculations literally overnight with a mind shift change. I mean, if we use the entire animal, all of those cal all those numbers, all of that math changes. You're talking about one animal providing more than double the amount of nutrition than we're using in that animal right now. Yes. And everything changes. Yes. We're using 40% of an animal with 40% food waste. And we're leaving, we're leaving so much on the table, which kind of dovetails into this conversation I want to have around food safety. Because yeah. some of what we're leaving on the table is are things that we do not have access to that we cannot, you know, if you are going through and especially for those of us that own restaurants or butcher shops or are serving the public and not just our own food that's hunted or, 
raised and then slaughtered on farm is that we can't have access to blood, to stomachs, to spleen, to testicles oftentimes. And some of this is really dependent on HACCP plans Mm -hmm. and what is generally recognized as safe. Uh, And this sort of, and I want to touch on this too, this idea of food safety around meat being very intense, which as a, as a butcher and maybe as a human that's been eating meat that's been sitting out in the sun for a long time might be, might be a little bit different. So I want to, I want to talk some about that as well, but we don't have access to these things. We can't access them. And so before I was a restaurant owner now, and it's so funny because my wife and I, we, we met in a restaurant, working in a restaurant. We started working the same day at the same restaurant. I was a new bartender. She was a new waitress in, in a restaurant in Princeton, New Jersey called the Alchemist and Barrister. Um, and we, <laughs> you know, we, we worked every Thursday night, every Friday night, every Saturday night, every Sunday brunch, and every, all our friends were going out having fun. We're like, we're never going to work in a restaurant world, or now we're uh-huh. owning one. We've resisted calling it a restaurant <laughs> forever, but it's a restaurant. Uh, it, it is a restaurant. Before that, um, my first experience with uh, has the plans and, 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 and the ability or not ability to get these things from the avatar of the butcher came, uh, David Asher wrote a fantastic, a, a book I've been waiting for, for decades, um, called the art of natural cheese making. And he is who I learned cheese making from, but before I met him, his book had come out and he, he, the first chapter in the book talks about how to take an unweaned calf and take the fourth stomach and extract yeah, the awesome. rennet from it. Yep. And take and, and how to and how to properly prepare it so that you can use it to set the curd on cheese. And, and he talks through it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have to do this. So I knew a, a, a local dairy farmer who keeps the girl cows for milk and sends the boy cows to the, to the butcher. And I also knew the abattoir and butcher. So I had it all covered. And I'm like, OK, I called him up and I said, I need this. And I'm like, you can't get that. I'm like, what do you mean I can't get it? She's if you just tell the butcher that you, you want to keep it. And he's like, I don't think I can do it. And we went round and round and round for yeah. weeks and through th- sending three rounds of animals to the butcher, I got close a couple of times and I'm like, we can't do it. I'm like, I don't understand how you can raise this animal and then send it to somebody to cut it up for you. And you don't have complete access to any part of that that you want. Yeah. Like I, I, I couldn't fathom it. Um, but that was the case. And it wasn't until actually to, to, to actually uh, put a, a, a button on this. I, I worked with David Asher in Iceland several years later um, at a, a, an amazing cheese making workshop. And uh, we did it finally with, you know, with an unweaned calf there and, and we were able to go through the entire process. But we didn't I, I didn't I couldn't get it more recently. Um, I was what was I trying to get? I was trying to get. Oh, blood. It was blood. And the butcher actually has a HACCP plan written for keeping blood. Wow. And that's rare. It is rare. That's and very I contacted rare. them and I said, we're do- we were doing this big event and I wanted to make this special blood sausage. So I contacted them and I said, listen, I want to test a couple recipes. Can I get, I forget how much I got, like a gallon or two gallons of blood. I said, let me get it this week. And then I'm going to test a few recipes. Then next week for the event, I need like four gallons or something. And they were like, absolutely fine. So I got the blood for the first week, tested the recipes, figured, you know, nailed it. I'm all ready to go. Um, we had set it up that I was going to pick it up the next Tuesday, the rest of it. And for, for the, literally the day before the event. And I called them up and said, yeah, I'm coming. He said, oh, I just got to let you know we, we, we couldn't keep it. I said, what do you mean you couldn't keep it? And they said, well, we couldn't. We had, we had a different USDA inspector on site. And they wouldn't let us do it. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, but you have the HACCP plan. Like, it's approved. And they said, yeah, I know, but it depends on the will of the USDA inspector. I'm like, are you kidding me? Everything was completely legal. Everything. And a, a personality got involved with that. Yes. I've had many of these experiences over the years. And... I, I know that also you tried to get insects some number of years ago and had to import them because they were not recogni- generally recognized as safe as per the FDA. And you talk in the book about activated charcoal use in cooking in New York City, which is now, yeah, 
because it's not generally recognized as safe as things like red number 40 and high fructose <laughs> corn syrup are recognized. So we won't get into that. But I think that this is really important because as we look at using that nutrition, there's a really base change mm. that has to be made around these HACCP plans and some of the federal oversight of mm -hmm. how this is managed so that these things are able to go into consumers' hands. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, and this, you know, I start the book off talking about, and I won't redo it here, but I'll just say one thing about it, talking about our experience as a family going deep into the bush in Kenya and drinking a combination of blood and milk mm -hmm. with some Borough warriors. And the, the big the takeaways here, which I want to make sure are very clear, is number one, these are the healthiest people I've, I've ever seen in my life. Now, it's anecdotal. I wasn't running all sorts of biological tests and I wasn't you know drawing blood from them and sending it to a lab or anything. But just being around these people, the aura that they gave off, the way that they looked to me, it was, you know, if, if I was a, if I could draw and I was to draw a picture of the ideal human form, it would have been what I saw there. And it wasn't one or two or three people. It was the entirety of the of, of the people that we were with. And ear to ear smiles, white teeth, white eyes. I mean, it, it was gorgeous people. They ate as a staple every single day, blood and milk. And for yes. certain parts of the year, especially the men and boys, that's all that they eat is, is, is consume as blood and milk twice a day, fresh blood and raw milk. And that alone was a great experience. One thing I didn't go into in the book was, you know, we were going in Ireland. Uh, we were living in Ireland for a year when I was writing most of the book and we were traveling around the world. And then at the end of my time in Ireland, and we lived on this gorgeous farm called Airfield Estate in, in, a, in the middle of Dublin. It was, it, it was a beautiful farm and I had access to as much raw milk as I wanted. I was making cheese before the milk even cooled down, the best way to make cheese. It was gorgeous. Um, and then, but it then came home back here to Maryland and the dairy laws in Maryland are some of the strictest in the country. Yes. And I remember being hit with that reality that, oh my gosh, I got to deal with all this nonsense around milk again once I got back here. And thinking to myself, you know, between that and the, the issue with getting that blood, it just hit me in the face like, oh my gosh, like we're not even scratching the surface and conversations about how to feed the planet, how to feed a growing population, how to make sure we're, we're nourishing ourselves. Like the two foods that were the staple of the healthiest people I've ever seen in my life. And that's, I've seen a lot of people around the world, the healthiest people I've ever seen in my life, blood, fresh blood and raw milk are in one case illegal. And in the other case, almost yes. impossible for me to even get, we're not even scratching the surface with these conversations. Yeah, I agree completely. And, and, and then I think this extends too to serving the public where, okay, there's, there's this wide range of ingredients we can't get. And then in the case for some states, Colorado being a good example, I would love to serve raw milk with our, we have a coffee bar at the new, at the new restaurant. We can't do that because you can't, well, you can get raw milk as just an end user consumer. You cannot serve it to people. And there's a lot of, depending on who your health inspector is and what that personality type is, how you age meat or how you mm -hmm. ferment different items can be of, of concern to that space. And, and I don't want to downplay food safety because it's incredibly important, but these are some of the hurdles to getting people more nutrient dense bioavailable foods in both a commercial and just personal use case. Well, don't, I want to make sure everybody understands this because some people might be listening and thinking that the, the goals that you and I have with food is aligned with the goals that the health department might have. And listen, there are some amazing people working for the health department. That's yeah, not what I'm, but, I but the goals are different. The health department is looking at the lowest denom common denominator with food and they want to make sure people don't get sick or die. Like what we're talking about, what you and I are talking about is, is nourishing people. And certainly we don't want anybody to get sick or die, but it is a completely different goal than just making sure that somebody doesn't get food poisoning from McDonald's, right? And, and even though there's some crossover, there's a lot of differences in, in, in how that can play out and we're hamstrung. Like, for example, you know, we do uh, fermented vegetables, a lot of fermented vegetables here. Every time I want to do a fermented, a, a new fermented vegetable, I have to, I have to not only create a HACCP plan for it, which is not that big of a deal, but I have to send it off to a lab. Like I, I have a pH meter here. Wow. Most states 
you have to get below 4.6 pH for fermented vegetables. Here in Maryland, we have to, or at least in this county, I have to get below 4.2. I have a pH meter. I check it. It's there. In fact, it's always there. In fact, I'm usually in the high threes. Like I've never not hit that mark. But if, if I'm making uh, sauerkraut and I decide I want to add apples to it, like by law, now I'm adding, I, I have a whole new recipe. And so I have to take that and send that off to a lab. I have to pay $150 for a lab test for it to come back to just tell me what I already know that the pH is below 4.2 and I'm not going to kill a customer. Um, it's, it, it's working on already slim margins. Yeah, you know. already working on slim margins, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we pay a lot of money and labor. We have an incredible team here, but we are paying a lot of money and labor. And to be able to, so it, it, that's preventing in many ways yes. us to be able to expand and, and, and do different things. It's a perverse incentive too. I mean, no restaurant is going to be incentivized to be making these nutrient dense foods if there are all these hoops and hurdles to jump through, to learn how to write HACCP plans or pay somebody to write HACCP plans, to send things off for testing. And I think that this is just something that I really wanted to touch on because I think, I think, it's, I think we're both passionate about it. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> um, and one of my questions for how it's affecting us is here we have this history, and I'm going to get into fermentation next, but this history of eating fermented foods and eating a really rich bacterial complement of things, you know, and, and maybe eating some things that are a little bit on the edge, drinking raw milk, drinking blood, interacting with animals that have dirt and a whole microbiome on their fur as that blood comes out and is getting inoculated with some of those things and what's on their hooves and how rich that's making our microbiome. And if mm -hmm. some of these, some of these, and I, again, food safety is very important. And you said earlier in this, that fire is actually a big part of a jump for humans in food safety that we're suddenly mm -hmm. able to kill some of these bacteria. But if our microbiomes are not getting more fragile for some of these, for some of these rules. Oh, and, and we know for sure they are right. Yeah. And there's a lot of stu great stuff being done uh, in, in that world. And, you know, microbiome tests being done on Hadza, for example, and comparing it to modern and average modern day North American. And some of the more recent articles that have come out are one of the greatest extinction risks of, our, of the modern day is of uh, the, the microflora that populates the, the human gut. I mean, it, it, it's insane. One, and when I did the, the great human race, we were gone for nine months. Um, and it's really fun. I, I, I back up very quickly. So when we did the show, I was really worried. I have two corneal transplants um, and I've been wearing since, and I, I had those transplants done 20 something years ago. And I've been wearing these really crazy, awkward, like uncomfortable, expensive contacts since then. And I was real, once I got cast for the show and, you know, knowing how authentic it was going to be, I was really worried that um, I was going to be in the midst of, you know, in the middle of nowhere somewhere and my hands are going to be dirty and I have to take these contacts in and out and they weren't going to let me do it. So I went and believe it or not, talked my surgeon into giving me, uh, uh, not LASIK, uh, the other mm. one, uh, the, the thing is like LASIK, I forget what it's called, yeah. uh, uh, surgery on top of my transplanted corneas. And he said, it's never done, but we'll do it. And he did it. And it's actually one of the best things I ever did. But I remember we went to these, um, these press interviews with, uh, with Nat Geo, like, a couple days after the surgery, and I couldn't keep my eyes open. And they're like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, well, I can't keep my eyes open because of the surgery. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I didn't think you guys let me have contacts. Like, oh, you could have had contacts. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> um, but, but, but my worry was real because two things were um, standard out there when we were actually living like our ancestors were living. One is I had no idea how damp I was going to be all the time. I was always damp. I rarely dried out, which I, you know, anybody, I think you would probably know that better than anyone with, you know, being on a farm, but I didn't realize how damp I was going to be. The other thing is I was never clean. Like I was never clean according no. to modern standards. I was never, yes. nothing on my body was ever sterilized, no. but it never made me sick. Like it never, it, it, in fact, it was probably helping me in some way that I uh, yeah, realized later so. on, but my hands were never clean. I was always eating. We were butchering. Our hands were inside of animals all the time. Oh, and in fact, one other quick side note, I'm sorry, but this is really don't, important. Don't be, don't be sorry. When we were with David Asher in Iceland doing this, um, this, this cheese course, we had people from all over the world there. Um, 
I don't want to say we, I mean, I was one of the students there. I wasn't teaching it. Um, I kept asking, I said, listen, man, I, I want to do this. I want to do this, uh, you know, make the rent. And, I, and he's like, dude, I got to find somebody to, to kill the, I can get a calf for us, but I got to find somebody to, to kill and butcher it. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I can do that. That's fine. And um, there was another guy there. He's a good friend of mine now, but he, he's from Kenya. And he, he was about, he's about 20 years older than me. Um, and he grew up, you can't hunt in Kenya now, but he grew up hunting in Kenya. So the two of us, he said, listen, you guys go do this. And then once you're ready and things are, there were some people in the class, even though they wanted to make cheese, didn't want to be around anything like that whatsoever. Um, so the, the killing part or the, or the butchering part, but when you're ready and you have all the organs laid out, then you can call everybody in. I said, okay, great. So it was just me and this guy, Dave. And we, I, I, it was, I love experiences that change a worldview that I've had in my entire life. Like they're just so transformative. And this was one of them. Once we, took all the organs out of, out of the body. Um, he was talking to me about when he's in the bush and it was, as a kid was hunting in Africa, it didn't work in this case because it was an unweaned calf, but typically with, with herbivores, which is mostly what he's hunting. As soon as he's done butchering, they cut the stomach open and take the insides of the stomach out. And they actually wash their hands with the inside of the stomach. And I'm like, wait, excuse me? Like I, I grew up my entire life hunting. And you know, if you pierce the stomach or if it was a bad shot and the stomach was inside, you're like, Oh my God, that's grossed out. And here this guy was cleaning his hands with the contents of the stomach. He's like, listen, man, a, these are herbivores and B the pH of that stomach is so incredibly low that there's nothing bad in it. Like that's one of the cleanest parts of the animal. And it oh. completely changed my mind. It was fascinating. Uh, that is, I love that so much. And I love that as somebody, it's always the first thing I want to do when, when that stomach comes out of a ruminant, I have a really, like, I just want to get in there. Um, and because I think it's so beautiful. Like I love looking at the progression of the rumen and exploring it with people from this, like almost shag carpet to this beautiful honeycomb. Right. And yeah, so I, I love that because that's often where I have my hands and when we're at home and we're just feeding ourselves, I'll just keep a towel and just kind of, we don't even keep a water bucket for dunking, but I <laughs> have a running joke that I get my probiotics every morning by going out and touching the goats and picking up our dirty eggs and coming back inside and cracking them without really washing my hands between. And that's part of my probiotic supplement. That's, um, that's and, not a joke at all. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and I think it's true. And I think, um, I just think it's interesting how far we've gotten through some of this and what we see in those microbiome studies. I actually want to dive in from here. I'm going through your book in a very uh, abnormal way, you know, so we've hit animal and I want to go into plant a little bit. Mm. Um, and looking at fermentation in particular, and I loved that you touched on getting into that calf stomach where it's essentially making cheese in that fourth chamber, the abomasum, and mm -hmm. how incredible that is. And I want to pair it with something that you said earlier about you know, some of these mechanisms of driving human evolution being problem solving and mimicry, because so much of what I look at as somebody that has a multi-species farm is that a lot of these technologies we've developed like fermentation or cheese making uh, to, to create more nutrient de dense and bioavailable matter are mimicking what a lot of animals do naturally. And Absolutely. when you look at a rumen, like it is, the, I think it is the most beautiful fermentation chamber that has ever been that you could ever imagine, right? But you could ever design. Um, and you actually, on one of your podcasts, pointed at something that I did not know, which is that fermentation also happens in the crop. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wonder at how this maybe mimicry of some of these systems and getting into that fourth chamber happened. And then I want to talk a little bit about how we can harness that for animals as well. So you, know, you make, bring up such a great point. Like you don't, this mimicry is not something that requires a lot of brain power to even observe. It just requires a connection with your environment, with nature, with your food. I mean, you don't, if you grow up on a farm, your parents don't have to give you the birds and the bees conversation. I mean, you witness it, you see it. I say it's not, right? Um, so those, you know, those of us uh, now or in the past who had access to animals, watching them grow, 
harvesting them, taking out the organs, seeing what's going on when we open up the organs. Now, this a lot of the natural processes that are happening in other animals are now the cornerstone of the technologies we use to create most of the food in, in, in our modern diet. So first off, fermentation, I have never heard about, read about, witnessed, observed, researched a traditional food way anywhere in the world that doesn't have fermentation at its core. And that doesn't just mean sauerkraut. I mean, so many of the foods that we uh, enjoy in, in the modern world are fermented. And that goes from meat. I mean, as you know, mm -hmm. real, real salami, real salumi, oh, that is yeah, a fermented dry food. Age. <laughs> and it's and it should, in, in, according to some people, and I, and I agree with it, like uh, Francois Vecchio, who I absolutely uh, think the world of, uh, you know, he, he says, we should be eating salumi that is just as alive and probiotic rich as any yogurt we get somewhere else. I mean, it, it's a health yes. food if we do it right. Uh, chocolate requires, real chocolate requires fermentation. Coffee, real good coffee requires fermentation. We can ferment, you know, sourdough bread, we can ferment fish. All of these things are fermented. So fermentation is key. So, and, and as far as the dairy is concerned, I mean, there's all these origin myths about how did we first figure out how to make cheese? The reality is Sardinia, there is a cheese making tradition where they take a, a baby, it's either goat or sheep, and they have it feed from its mother. And right after it feeds from its mother, it's slaughtered. So its stomach gets filled up with milk. And then they tie both, take the stomach out, tie both ends and hang it up. That's literally it. That's, that's all Beautiful. they do. And, Beautiful. And, and it's already, it's cheese. It, it cut yeah. months later. No, it's cheese immediately, but it is an aged cheese a little bit, a little bit later. You don't have to do a thing to it. The it thing comes in the its own casing. It's in its own casing. It's, it, it has all the uh, uh, um, uh, bacteria that it needs to do its thing. It's incredible milk. It's, it's perfect. We just now take that and do it outside of the animal's body in a big pot on the stove or in a big curd tank somewhere else, control some of the variables, and, and that's it in the real world. And back to that earlier conversation we had, I know in Maryland, I think all over the country, um, but in many parts of the world, you are not allowed to backslop in dairy. You're not allowed to do exactly what any of us do to buy a yogurt maker and take some yogurt from one thing and put it in the other. Um, actually, somebody's internet is cut out here. Hmm. Are you there? I am here. I can hear you. You are very clear to me. Okay, then let's keep going because it's going to record both, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, okay. So we're not allowed to backslop. You're not allowed to take... Uh, probiotic rich, bacteria rich, uh, fermented dairy and use that to inoculate a new batch, no matter what it is. We're not allowed to do it with kefir. We're not allowed to do it with yogurt. We're not allowed to do it with cheese, which requires cheese makers to be dependent on just a couple of huge factories in different parts of the world that isolate specific bacteria for a specific cheese or, or fermented dairy product and then puts it in a freeze dried culture that we have to use over and over again. So even with many of these traditional cheeses today, they're being made in a slightly different way with a, with, with a completely different um, bacterial profile than, than it would be in, in, in a different state. Um, but, you know, your, your other point about, you know, what, what is happening that we're observing that, you know, so the, the sprouting is, is huge. And, you know, the first time I saw that was actually in a, a duck doesn't technically have a crop. It has something very similar to a crop. But, you know, I, I grabbed this duck and it had been feeding on barley the day before. And I mean, its throat was swollen like it had an iron deficiency or something. And inside of it was nothing but barley that had, in this case had um, fermented and soaked. And a couple of them even started to sprout. And wow. all of those are helping detoxify those grains before it goes down further yes. in the digestive tract. In the same way, and, and we won't cover this because you've covered it so well in other podcasts and then in the book, that we harness some of these technologies to break down grains, to get to the real nutrition and to take away anti-nutrients that might be counter counteracting what we can get out of those grains, whether they're barley or wheat or maize. Absolutely. And, and I think that this is just so incredible in that mimicry. And one of the questions I had for you, I had this really beautiful moment that I emailed you about, but uh, we, we sprout feed for our pigs and for our chickens, for our monogastric animals mm -hmm. here on the farm. And I had hit, we've been sprouting feed for the last three years that we've been farming. And I pulled out this bucket and it had sprouted just so 
much better than they normally sprout. And as I'm doing this, I'm listening to one of your your podcasts as I do chores. And I was just considering this when we're thinking about making nutrients more bioavailable, even for livestock. Mm-hmm. And we're, you know, and a lot of people that listen to this podcast are farmers, and we've talked some about fermenting feed. And one of my thoughts when we initially started doing this was if I have a feed mix, you know, right now we're feeding a mix of peas, barley, and wheat to our pigs and chickens and ducks, and I can take away some of that phytic acid that is maybe binding to things like zinc within those grains, am I then? increasing the bioavailable nutrients eventually for myself that are going to be made manifest in an animal that is arguably healthier or has more access to that nutrition, especially as we've shifted towards, you know, in the last 150 years, feeding grains to animals. I I, I certainly don't have the data to to, to take one way or the other, but I can't imagine a world in which that isn't the case. I mean, we know uh, you know, even the fat profile that comes from the dairy of a cow that's grass fed on high quality grass or one that's being fed in other ways are completely different. I can't imagine a world that that isn't the case, certainly as well. You know, and one other thing I'd like to drive home here, Please. just for people who are listening, like, yeah, I, I get it, maybe the sprouting or whatever, but who really cares and does it make a big difference for humans? Um, and I forget if I talk about this on, in, in the when, when I wrote the book. I might have found out after the book. I have a uh, quote from you that might be. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, if we bypass that system, right? If and so I, anyhow, when I first observed this, I wondered to myself: if we bypass that, if we bypass the crop, bypass the gizzard, and just kind of stuck grains into the into the uh, stomach and we go through the small intestines and, you know, whatever, would it make a difference? And I'm like, I'd never, I'd never find out, but I did find out later on. I don't know if this is what you're going to mention, but there is a disease that ducks and geese in city parks get called angel wing disease. And this disease Mm. happens when the the nice old people sit on the bench and feed them bread. Um, That bread, even though it's the, the root of that bread is the same exact raw ingredient <clears throat> as the, excuse me, as they're used to eating grains, right? But that bread, the grains in that bread were never, you know, Wonder Bread was never allowed to sprout, never allowed to soak, never allowed to ferment. It was just, you know, a, a grain that was dried and ground and baked with yeast and it turned into the bread. And here are these, and this is, this is how, prof- to me, this is so profound. These animals are being fed literally what they're designed to consume at the very basic level, you know, those grains, but put yes. through a human cultural system where, where it could never have the opportunity to sprout or soak or ferment in the crop. And they have a nutrient deficiency disease because they're eating it in that form. Whereas if, if, wow. if the, if the old people sit on the bench, were throwing, you know, raw grains on the ground, everything would be absolutely, absolutely be fine. So here we are, we don't have a crop. We don't have a gizzard. We modern humans are trying to eat massive amounts of bread and we're not put, most of us are not putting it through that bacterial fermentation or soaking process or sprouting process whatsoever. And we're getting that same, you know, modern version of that angel wing disease. You know, we're malnourished because of it. And also the phytic acid, anti-nutrients are robbing our body of other minerals. So, but I just think it's incredibly profound because here's an animal that is eating basically the same food, but the technological changes of it are impacting its ability to get the nutrients it needs. It's fascinating. And the the quote I actually pulled was just how profound of an impact sprouting has, you know, and what you talk about in the book is you go through sourdough and you go through some of these processes that we can go through with grains, but sprouting has also been shown to make protein more soluble and digestible in millet by 55% and barley by 80%, as well as to increase vitamins (coughs) such as folate, niacin, riboflavin, thiamine, vitamin A, and vitamin C. For example, a 2007 study reports that after wheat was sprouted for four and a half days, the B vitamin folate increased by three and a half times, and sprouting also affects the levels of gluten. Absolutely. Uh, so profound. And one thing I recently found is, is that that paired with the bacterial fermentation of sourdough, and it only needs to get down to a pH of about 5.6, which isn't that much, right? If seven's neutral, it isn't that much of a fermentation to even get it down there. It has a um, significant impact on the anti, you know, disabling the anti-nutrients on the grains. 
So you're, you're, to me, and one of the things, the things I say in the book, a, a real 100% wild, long fermented sourdough bread that's made from grains, from sprouted, you know, flour from sprouted grains is literally the gold standard. And, I, and again, I would never tell anybody who um, isn't eating bread, they need to start eating bread to be healthy. Right? I don't believe we, we need it. But if you are eating bread, they are two completely different, they're completely different universes. What you and I are talking about and, you know, the kind of grocery store bread that most of us have access to. Different, complete, and, and the fact that when those of us who eat bread, eat bread on a daily basis, or our kids are eating bread on a daily basis, eat, what we just talked about were significant differences. But even if there were little differences, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they compound into something that is literally life-changing. Yeah. Um, I want to get in. How long do I have you for? Do you think you can go for, for go two ahead. hours? Okay. I think when we talk about compounding, I want to touch on geophagy because yeah. I think that this is just, and, and I'm skipping over some, some painful things to skip over, but um, you've talked so much about nixtamalization and, and things like that. And geophagy to me is fascinating. And, and this ingestion of dirt, the literal, the eating of, of earth. And one of the things I've been thinking about as I, as I read this piece of the book was that in a culture that <coughs> we have a lot of increased toxin exposure in, mm -hmm. in modern life. I mean, even, even if you're trying to avoid it, there's, there's stuff in the air, there's stuff in our clothes, there's, there's stuff in our food, right? There's just, there's just a lot out there that our bodies are being exposed to. And at that same time, we have ended this practice of eating, eating earth. And it has such a rich, a rich anthropological history in mitigating some of the toxins in some of these early plant foods, like early potatoes and, and, and various different things. And I think maybe it's more important than ever. And mm -hmm. this is something that has actually been really important for my husband and I to to explore the taking of clays and charcoals, maybe before we hop, hop in the sauna and, and things like that, and leaving some dirt on the food that we grow and allowing that dirt, which is the, it is the medium that is transmitting all of these beautiful minerals into, into your, your food as it is. Um, um, and to incorporate some of that. And so I was curious to get a little bit of a modern perspective on geography. <clears throat> yeah, and it's no surprise, and I just realized this now as you were talking, the woman that I talk about in that chapter that's fermenting the earth on the savanna in Africa and, and drinking it daily uh, is the wife of the guy that I was butchering that animal with in, in Iceland, <laughs> which, which makes complete sense. I mean, they are so tuned in to, to, to this and so connected to their food. Um, yeah, the, for anyone who think, I, and I thought it was weird in the beginning. I, I come from this anthropological perspective and archeological perspective, and I started looking at plant detoxification deeply about 20 years ago. And I have a box of files of just all the ways that people around the world continuously work to, um, to, to, to use technology to detoxify plants. And the one that kept coming up was this geophagy. I'm like, what is this geophagy? Like who's eating dirt? Like, what is this? And I thought it was so very weird, but I was fascinated by it. So I started to dive deeper. And then I started to, to find out that there were a lot of people still today doing it. A lot of people, not a lot. It's not that much of a common practice anymore with a lot of traditional indigenous groups. It's there. And I went to work with one of the last few that that, um, that actually practice it in Bolivia, the Aymara, uh, with potatoes. But um, there are, like you're talking about now, uh, there are people that are modern day people recapturing this ancestral way of, of eating and detox detoxification through eating eating clays. You can go on Amazon and buy edible clay. There's a book, one that I know of, but there's probably more now, on how to eat, eat clay. There's a couple of videos. There's a great video of this woman who... Um, I mean, and she, she, she's from somewhere down, down in the Southeast, maybe George, Alabama, somewhere. And she comes into this interview and I just remember being struck by this. This woman was dressed like, you know, professionally in a suit. She had just, she has, she has a, 
a, a, a white collar job and she walks into her house and she sits there and every day she eats a piece of clay, like every day. And she grew up doing this in her entire mm -hmm. life. There's tons of stories around the world of um, especially pregnant and even more so lactating women who just have are, are drawn to eating clay or mud because of a nutritional need that they have in their bodies at you know, one of the most nutrient needy times in their lives where they just naturally start to do this. Um, there is examples uh, in, in areas where there's um, in famines where people, they can't get food, but they're making these discs out of clay that they then bake and, 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 and give around. And one thing it does is fill people's stomach, but another thing it does is, is allow some of the minerals to, that they need for their bodies to get ingested. But the two reasons that animals, including humans, inject, the two main reasons ingest clay, and it's not all clay, it's special, it, it, it's different clays yes. that have different, um, different properties. One is to increase minerals in their diet, and the second reason is because with certain clays and certain toxins, the clays will bind with the toxin and it'll uh, be in a state that our body can't recognize. So it's not absorbed, <coughs> excuse me, something in my throat, and it'll, and it'll pass through our bodies. We see it, um, one place we see it is with potatoes, like I mentioned in Bolivia, where the Aymara are eating incredibly um, poisonous potatoes that otherwise would make them sick or kill them. And they're eating, uh, Every bite, these, the potatoes are dipped in the clay and then it's eaten. In between, every bite is dipped in the clay and eaten. And there were two big takeaways from that experience. Um, one is for the entire time I spent in South America researching ancient ways of, of, of dealing with the toxins in potatoes, every potato I saw cooked in any form, and I mean... I lived in Ireland for a year and I thought people ate a lot of potatoes in Ireland. Like it is nothing compared to the amount of potatoes that I saw consumed in uh, Bolivia and Peru. Um, every way that they were cooked, no matter how, no matter what the toxic load was of that variety of potato, whether it was boiled or baked or whatever it was done every time, except for one, they were peeled. And the reason they were peeled is because the peels have the most amount of toxins in the potatoes. So they were always peeled except when they ate them with the clay. And the potatoes that were eaten with the clay were also the most toxic potatoes that we consumed the entire time I was there. So it, they considered it such a powerful detoxification strategy that they didn't even bother peeling the potatoes, which I thought was fascinating. Um, the other example, oh, the other thing that I thought was, was fascinating was, okay, I get it. Like you, you could make the argument to me that this is an important detoxification strategy. And if they're going to eat these potatoes, which is important to them, they're going to dip it in the clay and, you know, get through that whole process. And, and that's fine. But what I found fascinating was at the end of the process, at the end of the meal, um, I was, I was sitting, I was with this family. Um, the youngest daughter picked up the bowl of the clay. Now the clay was, it was dried clay that was mixed with water and it was kind of a consistency of, of almost mayonnaise when we had it. She did the same thing with that bowl of clay after all the potatoes were eaten that my youngest daughter does with mayonnaise and we're done eating. She picked it up. My daughter loves mayonnaise. She took I her finger mayonnaise. and she scooped it all and stuck it in her mouth. And to I me, that, that was like, mayonnaise. yeah, <laughs> but, but cause we like the taste yeah. of mayonnaise. And to me, I came in from this outsider, like, Oh, these guys are eating clay and they're just going to barely make it through it because that's what they're doing. And no, no, it was relish. It was a flavor and a texture and an experience that was meaningful and they derived pleasure from. It wasn't just, I have to do a thing. Um, there's a lot of examples of all over the world and I'm hopefully going um, to witness one of them um, in, in June in Sardinia, but detoxification, detoxifying egg corns with clay. We have a lot of examples of Native Americans doing it. Uh, there's the earliest one, a very early traditional form of bread in Sardinia called Penispelli, and I'm sure I butchered the way that it's pronounced, um, was made. It's an egg corn bread. Some people think it's the precursor to polenta uh, before maize made it over to, to Italy. And it was made with egg corns, and it's a bread that's made with egg corns, clay, and ash, which I think is fascinating. And they're using the clay to help Amazing. detoxify. Yeah. Amazing. That's, yeah. And I think that this is, it's something I'd like to see make a return. Yeah. That I but, and and I'm curious what the cultural impetus for that is. And again, like readjusting our own taste buds to find to find what you're talking about and to find it in the right setting, of course, too. 
yeah, the context about, is very important. The context is incredibly important. Um, go ahead. That chapter, um, I, we had <laughs> we had a lot of discussions with my editor and also with um, the, the publisher. Like that chapter seems so. The, the name of the chapter is Earth, Ash, and Charcoal. All the other all the other chapters, you know, there's there's animals and then there's there's plants and you know dairy and all these all all our food categories we're used to. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this chapter earth ash and charcoal and they're like why do you need this chapter like all the other stuff is is making sense and then all of a sudden you're going to throw this weird thing in and i said well it's intentional and because hopefully everybody can after they read the other chapters can wrap their brains around this but it's still familiar right um you know plants are familiar to us dairy is familiar to us i want everybody to leave this book thinking hey these things are important but there's so much more we haven't even touched upon. Like we need to expand our, 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 our thought process behind this even further than just fermenting our vegetables or fermenting our dairy or butchering in a nose and tail way. And I said, we'll start here because, you know, I have a chapter on insects, which I know is a hot topic right now. I even heard you and Brian talking about it a little bit. Um, I have my own feelings about it. I and, think your feelings are good feelings. <laughs> and then there's the, and then there's the earth, ash and charcoal. Like these were major parts of diets, the consumption of earth, the use of ash and the use of charcoal in different ways. I mean, I wanted a whole chapter on um, uh, pre-mastication where you have mothers that are parents that are chewing their food to yes. give it to their babies when they're weaning them. I mean, we didn't even get into some of those things. So it's a great place. to. You know, I hope the book is a great place to start, but these conversations around blood and raw milk in our diets and charcoal and ash and clay are, are, are really where we should be spending all of our time, not arguing whether we should, you know, um, whether we should drink almond milk or raw dairy or something. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, I have one, I mean, I'd love to touch on insects too, because I actually recorded that interview before I had read your book and kind of dove into your work. But I have, I have something... I'd love to touch on culture, and I'd also love to ask you just a couple of questions about where you see the trajectory of modern humans going. And mm. it'll be a little bit of, uh, sure. of guesswork, but I do want to touch on this cultural importance. And you said something at the beginning of the interview, right? That it's a natural and cultural system that are driving these evolutionary factors. It's the complexity of our human interactions. And towards the end of the book and the chapter on sugar, you talk about how much the cultural context actually makes a difference. And one of the things I think a lot about is that we've lost the cultural part of agriculture mm. and that so much of our food is meant to be consumed in community and that that is a part of the food itself and that it is an intimate experience, both literally biologically, the the putting of food inside of our bodies, but also the cultural traditions that we share around it confers this sort of deep intimacy that I think is a nutrient on its own. And I think that- Oh, I like that. That's well said. Oh, wow. I think that you really touch on this at the end, and I don't want to leave it out because I think it, it might it might be the most important part in some ways is this cultural heritage of our food and the way that we share it. It's, 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 it's so, oh gosh, that's so important. Uh, and I want to give a couple of very quick examples um, yeah. and, and end with that, with that sugar piece. I, I, I'm actually in the midst of, of communicating with people uh, from Sardinia to, to hopefully learn the stuff that I, I'm, I'm going to learn. And one thing that's been very important to me is that, I've, I was trying to make the case why my entire family's coming uh, with me. And my, and other than filming the show and one or two small experiences, just because I couldn't bring everybody, my entire family's been with me every time we've gone and done research anywhere in the world. And there's a couple of very important reasons for that. One is because I obviously, anything I want to experience, I want to share with the people that I love the most. Um, but there's some other reasons too. One is because having a middle-aged woman and two girls and a boy of different ages also gave me access to parts of the food system there, the cultural system surrounding food that I alone wouldn't have access to. So for example, when we were in Kenya, there was one thing that we were studying this, um, this uh, ash yogurt called Mersic that men are not allowed 
to be in the place where it's made. <laughs> and the only way I learned about it wow. was because my wife and my daughters were there and were able to tell me about it when yeah. they came back out. So there's, there's age things, there's, there's uh, things that gender related things that, 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 that are very important, but just as importantly is the experience of a family coming into a family and being taken in and the culture surround the culture surrounding the technologies that we were really there to study the culture around it became even more important than the technology itself or at least you can't separate the two and you just can't take the technology that's you know very sterile it's very whatever but the entirety of that experience became incredibly important and on the other side of it as a as somebody who um, who writes who likes to speak who loves to teach and share information you know, me going into an experience, first of all, by myself would be a limited experience, but I would have seen it through my eyes and that's what I could relate back. And, you know, I can, I think I can relate to other 50 year old men very well, but if I want to share this information with uh, a 25 year old boy or an 18 year old girl or whatever, you know, seeing and experiencing it through my entire, the, the entire culture surrounding that experience with my entire family and then getting that feedback from them helps me share it a, a little bit as well. Um, so the culture is inseparable from the technology. It's inseparable from what true nourishment really means as humans. The, 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 you know, as we were talking, the one thing I was thinking about, um, about the context is, and I, I talk about it in, in the insect chapter, but, you know, my youngest daughter, when we went to, uh, to, to study uh, some traditional insect, insect consumption, we went the to unicorn Thailand. Cafe. Yeah, the unicorn <laughs> cafe. But the, so I, so you know, our youngest, I made this deal that she had to eat all the insects and then she could go to this place called the Unicorn Cafe that she wanted to go to. But the part was very interesting. For, so as a parent, I really screwed up because we brought her to the Unicorn Cafe first. We gave her the reward before, before the real work. <laughs> so that was, so, you know, we go to the Unicorn Cafe. It was a horrible experience. I, I still have PTSD from it. But for you um, or for then her? we go and, what's that? For you or for her or both? Oh, for me, oh my gosh, I can't believe I even let my family eat the food that came out of it. It was, it was, it was an ethnography in itself. It was fascinating. It was fascinating. But we went after that engaged in a series of different insect related consumption experiences. Um, and they weren't even that hardcore. Like we had, for, one was at the, one of the best restaurants we've ever been to in our life that focused on insects and focused on insects and everything was plated beautifully and presented well. And the tastes were complimentary. It was amazing. She wouldn't eat any. We um, were in one of the markets in Bangkok. She wouldn't eat any. We ended up going to uh, the house of a guy that was starting a company using cricket powder. He's from Italy, but he was living in Bangkok and he started a, a pasta company using cricket flour she wouldn't even eat any of the pasta. She, I think one piece of it and we couldn't get her to do it. Like, I'm like, Alyssa, we're, we're, we're here. Like, how can you not do it? She wouldn't do it. The only time she did, and we didn't even have to force her was we went into the middle of nowhere in a place, a little village called Fitzinulek. And we spent the day with a weaver ant egg farmer and the entire community came in and we harvested these eggs and we cooked with the entire community all day long. And at the end of that, so she was a part of the entire process and she was there and you know, she was cooking with all these girls and these women. And you know, there was a huge language barrier, but it didn't matter because food was kind of the universal language here. And, mm -hmm. and there was, there was laughter and there was touching and there was sharing and all of it was happening. And then at the end, all the food was presented, the food that she was a part of, right? The entire process and everything that was served had insects in it. And she yeah. sat down and chowed, like she just ate. Like she was sitting at a picnic here with hot dogs and hamburgers in, in America. And it was because of that context. It was because of the culture, you know, otherwise I was taking a, you know, a girl from the you know, modern American girl and like sticking her in a situation. In this case, we built the situation around her and that context was so very important. So that sugar chapter for me was the hardest chapter to write because I have had such a unhealthy relationship with food my entire life. But it went on both sides, like some parts of my life, I was addicted to sugar and that was unhealthy. And then other parts of my life, more recently, I realized the dangers of carbohydrates, especially with sugars in my, in, in my life and completely excluded them, which in some ways was just as dangerous on a cultural level. And one of the things that I write about in that chapter, and I, I still like, 
I, I almost tear up when I think about it. There were years where I refused to eat a slice of birthday cake at one of my kids' birthdays. And in, in fact, there were some instances where my oldest daughter actually made the cake for one of her siblings and I didn't eat it. And because I was so hardcore on the other side. And while there's a lot of biological reasons that that might make sense from a human perspective, you need both the uh, emotional slash cultural nourishment as well as the biological nourishment. And I was missing out on it. So my rule right now is I never say no to a piece of birthday cake. I love that. And I think that's really beautiful to put things back into a cultural context because we can't miss that. And I think some of this dietary dogma that we're experiencing is just, it's devoid of context, right? It's happening mm-hmm. inside of a vacuum, but our lives don't happen in a vacuum. They happen right. in community with one another, hopefully. I mean, that's that's the most we can hope for. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It's beautiful. I have a couple of just quick questions sure. that we might postulate about now and modern humans, given what you understand about the archaeological record and what has shaped us. And the one I'll start off with just really briefly is, I think, Culturally, we might be missing out on some of the intangible benefits of processing foods. And, mm-hmm. you know, you talk a lot about the the nuance in processing, not talking about the hyper palatable processed foods like Doritos of modern day, but the processing, the act of preparing, uh, fermenting or winnowing, you know, grain or all of these different processes that we would have spent a lot of time doing that brings us... I mean, those intangible benefits would have looked like the community that you're talking about, right? The mm-hmm. chance for women and girls as they make this specific kind of yogurt to to be together and learning from one another, or the chance to sit around and, and not just eat dinner together, but to prepare dinner together. Yeah. So, you know, the one thing that comes to mind, uh, and uh, I mentioned it in the book in the Nishtamalization chapter, the Molina we called, it was referred to as the beating heart of her village. So um, being an, I, the, the, this Molina, which I'll talk about in just a second, was the Irish pub of this village in the middle of nowhere uh, on top of a mountain outside of Oaxaca, Mexico, um, and served so many important purposes. When we went to learn the process of Nishtamalization from this amazing family, a little tiny village top of a mountain. And until recently in the villages and in, in, in especially in rural Mexico, every family nishtamalized their maize and then sto- literally ground it on stone the next day. And it's still happening in some places now, but in, in most cases you have the families that are still nishtamalizing and then they carry buckets of the nishtamalized maize to a central location because the village was able to get a molino, which is still stone grinds it, but it's like a three or five horsepower machine that's grinding it. There's a, you know, usually a woman running it and, and you bring it there. And it's fa- two things are fascinating about it. One is that was the Irish pub. That's where people gossiped. That's where people met mates. That's where people saw their friends. That's where people, you know, learn news and passed on information. I mean, it was, it was a wonderful experience and there was a line of people and that line made it possible for people to spend more time together. And then they'd run it through, um, and as they were running it through, it was this beautiful system of, there was a woman running the machine, uh, a person pouring the nishtamal into the hopper on the top. And then the person who had just ground theirs stayed back and helped scrape the drum at the bottom. And then they went off and then they, they were all helping each other. I mean, it, it was awesome. It was, it was absolutely awesome. Yeah. The other part that is a com- little bit of a side note, but I want to mention it very quickly, is those you know, traditional foods for any culture are incredibly important. And, you know, then, you know, there's a traditional food for a culture and then there's the individual um, sort of um, specialties that make it special for each family. They do this a little different, do this a little different. And the way that people stone ground it themselves was one of those things that made it different for, for each family and then each culture. But now that's sort of been standardized because of mm. this central Molino. And what we see is the act, something as simple as nistomalization. And, and the process very quickly is you take a little bit of this calcium hydroxide, which they dig out of the ground there. It used to be wood ash. You, you put a certain amount in with the maize and water and you simmer it for about a half an hour. 
turn off the heat, let it sit overnight, and then the next day it's nishtamal. It's going through this magical chemical and physical changes uh, because of that. The little things people decide to do differently now, like they put a little more cal in or a little bit less, or they boil it a little bit longer, they simmer it a little bit longer, let it soak a little bit longer. This is how people are, um, this is how different families are still expressing their individuality through this very traditional food, even though a part of it has been centralized, which I, I know it's off topic, but I thought it was beautiful. No, no, so no, it's perfectly on topic. And I think that's what I'm asking because that's such a beautiful example of coming together mm -hmm. as a community. And also, you know, this passing down of specificity through family. And, in, you know, in that community setting where you're helping everyone at the Molina, I bet a lot of differences sort of fade into the background. Like mm. <laughs> yeah. you're not, you're not, you're not thinking about, I don't know what makes you and your neighbors different. You're, you're acting on something that is bringing you together for, for a shared purpose or goal. But the other thing too, that is, is, is very important to mention here. And yeah. this is a very human thing that's missing today is, is, you know, one example is that Melina. So there's every, all the scraping was done with their hands. So the woman from a completely different household turned around and the food that was going into another family's mouth, the main staple that was going in every person in that other woman's family's mouth, every bit of it was scraped out of the drum with this woman's bare hand. And then it, it repeated and repeated, wow. you know, that's amazing. And yeah. that's special. And there's, there's a kind of a human connection there, but there's also truly in a good way, a bacterial yes. connection and, and passing on. One of the things that I thought was fascinating about um, the, in, in fact, there were people that suggested I take this out, but I, I, I forced to put it in. in. In the insect chapter, I talked about the experience it being at one of the open markets in, in Bangkok. And remember this, a lot of this book was finished at the beginning of COVID and, and the idea of these, you know, wet markets and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, but the, one of the things that I thought was beautiful and we kept in it, but again, I was, I was pushed a little bit to take it out was what I witnessed at this market was, I, look, I love farmer's markets anyhow, but these markets are intense where in many cases, the animal that somebody was going to take is, is standing there alive and, and is killed yeah. and slaughtered and eviscerated right in front of them, which I thought was connective, if not beautiful. But at the same time, there was no, you know, everybody had hands out and they're collecting food and they're touching, like they're literally touching hands. And I know that happens at our markets as well. And I think it's a beautiful thing. So you're exchanging food, you're exchanging information and you're physically touching one another in that, in that yes. transfer of money or food or whatever it happens to be. Yes. That is missing in the majority of the modern industrial food system. And we need to get it back. Yes. Yes. And I think I, I can't imagine anything more vital than than actual physical touch being exchanged, you know, and that information being exchanged at an emotional level, at a microbial and bacterial mm -hmm. level, this exchange of microbiomes that's happening, this it, it, it's more in for it's cultural information like this is something that's critical and missing. And I think that when we seek out that level of connection, something changes in our food. And I think it's a part of eating like a human uh, uh, just to, to put it, to put it in your words. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I have so many more questions for you, but in some ways I think that's a really beautiful place to, to sort of put a bookend on this. I have okay. a lot of questions about where you think food and humans are going. Um, but I, it, it's such a big, well, let me say one thing, maybe, and I can do this very quickly. No, I, I love, love this. I'm not okay. in a hurry. I'm not in a hurry. I just want to make sure you get the rest of your day back because I think, yes, go ahead. Uh, so this isn't a direct answer to it, but it's something I think about quite a bit and I'm, con I'm convinced of. There's, I don't think there's many hard lines that we can draw in, in this discussion. There's a lot of gray areas that are incredibly um important and, and, and places where the reality and the truth really lies. And I really have a problem with um, in, in the modern dietary world, and even in the modern ancestral dietary world, where we're drawing this hard line at the agriculture revolution. Like there's this suggestion that everything before it was just inherently good and everything since it is inherently bad. 
And I don't agree with that whatsoever. A lot of, a lot of negative things change when we, when we start growing our own food. But if you're coming at it from this technological perspective, like, like I am, um, what I see is that any time that we are using our own innovation or our technologies to take any raw material and make it as nourishing and uh, safe and ethical and sustainable as possible is a good thing, like is a positive thing. So there, it's not that at 12,000 years ago, everything goes to hell. A lot of things change, certainly, but there's been a lot of amazing innovations um, since 12,000 years ago in our food that we Jeez. should embrace and be excited about. Yes. And on top of that, you know, if we use, so as far as where I would like to see things go, what I would love to see happen is, and, and this is obviously easier said than done. I would love to see all of us take a step back and realize the value and understanding our ancestral dietary past as a mechanism, a foundation for building us as humans. And that should be our foundation in my mind of what we should think about as an incredibly nourishing baseline diet, because that is the diet that built us as humans. That's the diet that supported massive body and brain growth and, and population growth and all of those things that we you know, enjoy now in, in our bodies. And from that point forward, we should embrace continued technological innovation, whether it's in food processing or whether it's in uh, nutrition science or biology or whatever it happens to be to take that and take it to the next level. I do not believe the ideal human diet has been created yet. I do not believe the most ethical and sustainable and nourishing diet for humans has been created. The ancestral dietary past is the foundation for where we should start this thought process. And then we should embrace anything, any tool that we can use to help us do it even better um, from, from that point forward. So there's a lot of people that think the world is going to hell, <laughs> and especially in a nutrition sense. And right now we're in a really bad place from uh, human health, planetary health, you know, all of those things. But I have, I'm really excited about where if we do it right, we can take all of this. The key, and this is where I'll, I'll kind of end this, the key is, ha is that we all have to come together around a table and realize what we have in common. Yes. Carnivores, yes. keto, ancestral, vegetarians, vegans, all of us need to get into the same conversation and then figure out what's important and, and how we get there. And, and I, I, I really think we can. I really think we can, or at least we have to, for sure. I could not agree more. And I think that's such a beautiful space. And as you were talking, I was thinking about times in which the human species has theoretically sort of hit a bottleneck population wise. And I think it's when we hit these pinch points, right? Whether it's, it's from a population sense or it's from a, a cultural sense or it's from a food sense that explosive growth happens following mm -hmm. them. And, and I, and so I think that this is a, it's a ripe time, even though it feels dark and kind of sticky and, and confusing out there. Um, Bill, thank you. Thank you so much for, for entertaining a, a, a sort of funny, different interview for talking to me about thumbs and about culture and everything else. I can't recommend to the listeners, your book, different podcasts that you've been on, which I'll link to in the show notes and just tell people where they can find you. And we'll have links to those two in the okay. show notes. Absolutely. So anybody, first of all, if anybody's in the area, we're on the Eastern shore of Maryland and Chestertown, Maryland. So physically you can find us here at the modern Stone age kitchen and the Eastern shore food lab. Um, and uh, online, you can find information about the Eastern shore food lab at Eastern shore food uh, My work, you can find at eat like and our family restaurant. You can find at a uh, modern stone age kitchen.com. And then on social media, you can find us at, at Dr. Bill Schindler. So at DR Bill Schindler, at Modern Stone Age Kitchen and at ES Food Lab. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting you soon in the future and I'm just so appreciative of your time. Well, it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much.